Good evening, good afternoon, and even good morning to some of you, depending on where you are joining us from the world today. A very warm welcome to the University of Glasgow's inaugural World Changing Glasgow Conversation Series. This is our new flagship event that connects individuals and ideas to drive change and deliver impact at a time when this has never been more important. It also gives us the opportunity to connect in with you, our Team U of G Global Community. I'm Rachel Sanderson, Vice Principal of External Relations here at the University of Glasgow, and it is my immense pleasure to be your host for today's discussion. Our first topic in this exciting new series is, of course, something that impacts on each and every one of us. COVID-19 and the effect the pandemic has had on economies around the world. Giving us your thoughts and provocations, I'm thrilled to introduce leading economist and our own principal and vice chancellor at the University of Glasgow, Professor Sir Anton Moscatelli, and an alumnus who is also one of our incredible donors, an honorary doctor of the University of Glasgow and global managing partner of McKinsey & Co, Kevin Sneeder. Together, they will discuss the impact of the pandemic on economies and how governments and business might reset for growth and find their way to the next normal. We'll begin with a short presentation from both and then we'll move straight on to questions and many thanks to all of those who have submitted some questions in advance to us. We'll also try to pick up on some of our thoughts and comments from the live audience this evening via the chat function. So if you do have a burning question for our illustrious speakers, please do pop it into the chat and we'll do our best to pick up on as many of the themes as possible. But without further delay, since I know that time is short, I would like to welcome Anton to take to the virtual stage. Anton, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Rachel. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here for this inaugural World Changing Glasgow conversation. And I'm equally delighted to share a panel with Kevin, one of our most distinguished alumni and a great friend and supporter of the university. In my 10 minutes, I'm going to focus on the macroeconomic impact of COVID-19 and the implication this has for the future of the global economy and really choices for policymakers. And to frame this, I think it's helpful to identify three distinct phases to the pandemic. Uh, first, the initial emergency stage where many nations locked down and economic activity ground to a halt. Second, uh, the intermediate phase, which is we're living through at the moment, living with the virus and characterized by further waves of COVID. And third, the exit period, when we finally move out beyond the pandemic and establish a form of normality, hopefully an, an economic recovery. The first thing to highlight uh, around the initial phase is just the scale of the shock that the global economy experienced. It's been uh, the largest systematic downturn for most economies since modern industrial uh, times. And just to put this in, in context, this is a graph of uh, quarter-on-quarter quarter GDP uh, growth in the UK since uh, 1955, you, you'll see that actually, you know, most of the ups and downs have been smaller blips. Uh, even the 2008-9 Great Financial Crisis Recession, which remember was the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, during that period, UK GDP shrunk by no more than 2.1% in any given quarter. In quarter two of this year, as you can see from this graph, UK GDP contracted by 19.8%. Now, in the UK alone, the initial fiscal response, uh, and that encompassed measures such as the coronavirus job retention scheme, loans and grants for businesses, additional welfare support, is estimated at about £200 billion. And the picture is very similar across the Western, Western world, because across Europe's five largest economies, over 40 million workers have been put on government job support schemes. And central banks have injected about $3.8 trillion into economies across the US, the UK, and the Eurozone. Now, over the summer, these massive interventions, uh, coupled with a loosening of, of restrictions on movement, produced an initial economic bounce back. Uh, but this uh, recovery has been partial. It's been uneven and extremely fragile in the countries most affected by the pandemic. Uh, this uh, shows you the graph of the recovery in some of the Western Hemisphere countries that have been most affected. It's, actually, it's added Australia as well, uh, but most of them are Western Hemisphere. Uh, and, and the IMF have really captured this neatly when they talk of the long ascent facing the global economy. It's going to take some time to return to where we were before. And that's a characteristic of, uh, of, of this intermediate phase that we're in. Uh, 
Now, most of us have now accepted that we will have to live with the virus for a period to come. Uh, one of my senior medical colleagues has aptly called this the petty COVID phase. COVID, COVID's around us and, and we're going to have to live with it. Now, I know Kevin's going to talk a bit about vaccines and the way out of this, so I won't. But, uh, you know, this will remain a work in progress for some time. We're going to be living with COVID for some time. And whilst the extent of the second wave is unknown, uh, because we don't know how effective measures short of a full-scale lockdown will be, the concern is that the surging cases in many Western Hemisphere countries will stop the recovery in its tracks. And, and uh, economic assessments, which did consider a second wave, paint a very gloomy picture of its impact with a second slump, potentially, in GDP, a W-shaped recession. So in this context, what, what short-term actions might policymakers take to support the economy? Uh, one of the things that I want to emphasize is just to reject this notion that there is some sort of inverse trade-off or an easy trade-off between public health and economic recovery. You, you know, you don't can't sacrifice the public health to, to, to obtain economic recovery. This is quite a good slide, which the Financial Times has used. In fact, actually, if you want visualizations of, of the pandemic, the FT is, is very good indeed. And, uh, and this slide shows very clearly that the country seems to hold. Uh, countries that have done better in terms of keeping the pandemic wave low have also seen less economic slump. Uh, and indeed, rather than uh, existing as separate factors which can be played off against one another, economic and health performance are inextricably linked. And this is because there is a third element to the equation, and that's public confidence, confidence by consumers and business. So some of the Asian countries you'll see in this graph are, are, are to the le left of the graph uh, at the top. They acted swiftly to suppress the virus. They restricted travel. They had very effective test and trace systems, and they've done better in economic terms. And some, it's difficult to make cross-country comparisons, but if you make pairwise comparisons of countries in the same geography, because they are similar, and that's quite interesting. Uh, look, for instance, at the data points in this graph of Sweden and Denmark. During the early lockdown phase of the pandemic, famously, Sweden operated a much looser policy, putting greater emphasis on individual responsibility and imposing fewer restrictions than other neighboring countries. And, and yet, despite this, economists have found that the Swedish fall in consumer spending was very similar to that in a country like Denmark. And you'll see that in this graph where Denmark and Sweden's performance in GDP in the first half of 2020 was very similar. In, in other words, individuals modify their own behavior despite the differences in government advice. So instead of indulging in a crude and reductive argument which pits public health against the economy, governments really have to recognize that economic recovery will ultimately be shaped by the prevalence of the virus and public confidence in how the pandemic is being handled. The trade-off between health and the economy only reappears when the R number, or more accurately the RT number, the effective reproduction number, is well below one. At that point, it reappears. But as soon as the virus is accelerating, the trade-off vanishes. Now, beyond the depth of the economic decline, the other truly remarkable feature of this crisis is, just, is, is its differential impact on sectors. This time, things are very different uh, in terms of the recession. And as a result, economists are now talking about a K-shaped recovery. Now, what does it mean? It means that not all sectors will recover. And uh, the most striking aspect of a K-shaped recovery is the sheer disparity between winners and losers. And the dynamics here are, are, really, are, are really obvious. On the downside, we have tourism, hospitality, leisure, high street retail, airlines, transport, etc. On the on the upside, we have tech companies, healthcare companies, online retail, and some financial services, and so on. And this has policy implications because in the intermediate phase, as regional lockdowns now are proliferating across Europe, certainly, and indeed in France tonight, there's even talk of a complete lockdown. It would seem sensible for governments to intervene and support those industries and business unable to trade due to the reposition of restrictions, because ultimately support needs to be geared to those sectors which require assistance most and, importantly, have the potential to recover. Now, this can not continue indefinitely, but in the current phase, job protection, I think, must remain an overarching priority. There will come a time to switch focus towards job creation and so subsidize new job creation through, say, reduced uh, national insurance and taxes on employment creation, but this must be carefully calibrated. And, and judging this transition point will be fiendishly difficult and policymakers will need to make use of all the real-time data at their disposal to get it right. But, but on balance, I think the greater risk rise, lies in moving too early. Uh, premature withdrawal of support threatens to increase unemployment at a time when confidence remains very shaky. 
Indeed, sustained fiscal and monetary activism, I think, is likely to be a feature of the next normal, uh, so the final phase. With this in mind, I just wanted to conclude with four brief thoughts on the next normal. First, um, in the years ahead, public investment needs to be uh, geared towards sustainable growth. However, this presents a dilemma, and, th and this graph shows you some IMF projections for net uh, debt to GDP for the G7 economies. Um, both the IMF and the Institute for Fiscal Studies project that the UK public sector borrowing will be very high as a result of the fiscal response to the pandemic and the slow recovery. Uh, uh, indeed, the IMF in this original projection uh, that you'll see that you see here saw sees the UK net debt to GDP ratio stabilizing around 100% of GDP by 2025. But it could be worse because uh, under a scenario of a second wave and the, and the impact of targeted regional lockdowns into the first half of 2021, the IFS actually estimate a UK budget deficit of over 20% of GDP this year, with UK debt to GDP rising to nearly 120% by 2025. And, and you would see similar higher figures for all the other countries. So now high debt to GDP ratios can be sustainable. Japan has had a high ratio for many decades, but that critically depends on whether the borrowing is domestic, whether savings rates, uh, domestic saving rates are high, and on the difference between economic growth and interest rates. And monetary policy is said to co continue to be loose across the West for a period to come. But it's a potential knife edge, uh, high debt to GDP ratios. An extra borrowing really seriously limit a country's room for maneuver should a further crisis emerge. My second point is that there's a need to identify a number of priority areas for public investment. And there are some obvious candidates here. Uh, for instance, greening the economy is absolutely essential. We know that we're facing a climate emergency. We need to address this. But there are other areas too. Public R&D spending is another strong candidate for investment in that it's known to spur innovation and jobs, enhance productivity and growth. Uh, and this brings me to my third point, and that's resilience. I think there's two considerations here. Uh, the first aspect concerns healthcare resilience. Uh, Asian countries learned from the SARS episode, which uh, simply, uh, they learned lessons which simply weren't absorbed in the West. And while the next crisis won't look like this one, we need to be better, better prepared, I think, for future healthcare emergencies, including developing our testing capacity and disease monitoring in our health, in our health supply chains. And the second element concerns supply chain resilience. Uh, the pandemic highlighted vulnerabilities within lengthy global supply chains, and indeed, uh, McKinsey, uh, Kevin's uh, organization, found that 93% of firms are planning to make supply chains more resilient as a result. Now, the danger here is that resilience slips into economic nationalism, that rather than smoothing supply chains, there's a march to unpick them. Now, that would be disastrous because I think protectionism remains one of the greatest threat to the long-term recovery of the global economy. And fourth and finally, there's the issue of inequality. We know that this is a highly unequal crisis, that the impact will fall disproportionately on the young, on working women, on minorities and those with lower skills. And for instance, the IFS, again, has found that women uh, are around a third more likely to work in a sector heavily affected or shut down by the pandemic uh, in the UK. And like, likewise, the Scottish government, the advisory, the Scottish government's advisory group on uh, economic recovery, of which I was a member, highlighted the impact on young people and the potential for labor market scarring. Now, inequality, I think, concerted, uh, requires concerted attention from policymakers, both domestically and supranationally. And we need to think urgently about how to, uh, to change that dynamic. Now, I'm out of time, but I hope this gives you a flavor of some of the challenges and opportunities that policymakers face. I think in some sectors of the economy, the impact of the pandemic has been and will continue to be absolutely revolutionary. In others, we're likely to witness a more marginal effect an evolution where pre-existing trends are accelerated rather than reinvented altogether. But what is beyond doubt is uh, the number of big questions and hard choices on the horizon. Uh, ultimately, I think governments have no alternative but to remain flexible and take an activist and ambitious policy approach, both fiscally and in monetary policy, to engineer growth so as to face the long-run sound money constraint, because that will be there. Now, we'll get past the pandemic and there will be an economic recovery, but just how quickly this will be achieved and its scope and scale remain far from certain, I think. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you so much, Anton, for kicking us off with such a clear and insightful overview. And I think many of the points that you've touched on around those trade-offs and particularly the inequalities of the pandemic uh, 
are definitely things that I'm really keen to come back to when, when we get to Q&A. Um, before handing over to Kevin, I also just want to say hello to the audience that have joined us. Um, I believe we have people with us from Buenos Aires, from Bavaria, and um, perhaps a bit more locally from Airdrie. So, um, so welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, Kevin, can I now hand over to you just to give us your thoughts on what that road to recovery might look like and the impact of pandemics on global economies? No, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Anton. It's a real pleasure to be back home. Uh, what is this morning, this afternoon here in New York? So it's uh, a pleasure to do so and to share a few thoughts. And I'm going to try and do it with one slide. I, I usually come armed with an array of PowerPoints, but I'm going to hide behind one slide for the duration of this presentation, if we can pop that up. And I'll try and answer the question of where are we, what's happening, and where are we going? Uh, and before I do that, and I'm gonna go vertically, so that first column, first and foremost, let's remember that this is a humanitarian crisis. We will drift into talking about the economics, but it is a humanitarian crisis. Uh, 43 million cases, uh, 1.2 million deaths, if you believe the latest numbers in Johns Hopkins. This is at a scale, as Anton rightly says, that is truly and sadly unique in a negative sense. So we should remember that as the backdrop for the conversation. We should also remember, I think, what Anton said. There have been from the start, and we, I will argue there remain two goals, two goals. One is to save lives, and the second is to safeguard livelihoods. Save lives and safeguard livelihoods. One without the other is insufficient. Uh, I don't believe that it is possible to safeguard livelihoods if the health situation remains one that is troubling, impacting the way in which lives are being led. That is just not a recipe for long-term economic success. However, if livelihoods are not protected, then there is a very real second order effect on healthcare, and we're seeing that in many parts of the world. So the challenge in all of this, and then the unenviable challenge for policymakers, is to do two things, save lives and safeguard livelihoods. And that is, of course, not straightforward. Who would want to be a policymaker when that is the choice that you have to make and the need to do both is not easy. So let's try and get into what's going on and, and how are we doing against each of these dual goals. Well, the shape of the recovery and the reality in which we find ourselves is, of course, going to be deeply impacted by whether or not the vaccines arrive. I'll get to that in a moment. But as we look at the situation, I am very struck that the summer was essentially a magical tour of the alphabet. It really was. If you recall at the beginning of the summer, a sort of March, April, so really more in the spring, we were talking about when will the V-shaped recovery occur? In other words, a sharp down, and then we'll get back up. When that didn't happen, we shifted to, well, it's really a W. We'll come down, go back up, come down again, and go back up. And that didn't happen. Then we moved to explore the letter U, because we thought, well, actually what's happening is we're going to be down for a bit longer, and then we'll bounce back. That didn't happen. So then economists and others shifted to having fat use. We're going to stay in this trough for longer, then we'll pop back up. That hasn't happened. Then there was an exploration of, okay, we've given up in the alphabet, let's see what else we can come up with. And there was the Nike swoosh, sharp down and then a long, steady recovery. That may actually still be an option that's out there. But we then saw the check mark briefly make an appearance in the sort of end of summer moment when people thought, you know what, this spread is reduced. The economy seems to be doing okay. Maybe it was a check mark after all, sharp down, and then we're popping back up, not quite in a V because the down was a bit more pronounced than we thought. Well, that's all in the past. Now we've moved into what we're calling the K-shaped recovery, and Anton already touched on this. The notion that this is a bit like a hurricane that hits an island. It devastates one part and leaves another part that actually is doing okay, may even be thriving. And we're seeing that in economies. We're seeing a very differentiated impact on different parts of the economic makeup of a country. We're seeing the way in which leisure, entertainment, travel, I could go down the sectors, Anton's already done so, so I won't repeat that. On the one hand, and we're seeing technology and other sectors enjoying quite the opposite, where their demand for what they do has never been greater. I think about your local supermarket. That's a business which usually has growth in line with demography, i.e. it barely grows. Now what we're seeing is very significant growth rates because people have stopped going to restaurants, turned to home cooking, and massive demand for food. Net result of all of this, K-shaped recovery, maybe. The problem we've got is each part of the K counters the other, and we're still way off where we were. This has been a moment in time when, as Anton showed, we've had the devastation in terms of economic impact equivalent to the 
Great Depression of the 1930s. The speed at which it occurred has not been seen before, much quicker than, for example, the global financial crisis, which previously held the record for a rapid moment of uncertainty and deep economic impact. And the fear associated with this, which really is also a major factor here, is akin to, let's say, 9-11, or some of the major shocks that have really impacted whether people feel safe and secure or not. That's the backdrop on the economic side. The question, of course, is, are the vaccines coming to the rescue? And if so, how quickly? And what does that do to the economic scenario as we're all contemplating? Well, there is some good news on the vaccine front. And the good news takes several forms. The first is there are over 275 vaccines in development, maybe even north of 300, if you're prepared to accept those that Russia and indeed Venezuela has recently joined the party, have started to say are coming. Secondly, the development timeline that's being pursued is four times faster than any prior vaccine. Let's not forget that. Rapid amount, vast innovation, amazing scientific effort going into this activity. Capacity is being produced for about 11 billion vaccines globally. That's a remarkable number. And over 17 billion US dollars has been invested in vaccine development. And the reason for all that money and investment going in is of course obvious. There's an increasing view that the vaccine is what will save us. But it's also because actually there are three things that need to happen if that is going to be true. The first is science needs to get there. It is probable now, probable, not definite, but probable there will be some kind of vaccine approved for emergency use in the United States by the FDA. And if you use that as the gold standard, that may well happen by the end of the year. It may well happen, but it's not all public information. However, that's only one part. It's a huge part, but it's only one part of the challenge. The second part is to distribute that vaccine. And the vaccines have different characteristics. The one that's likely to come to market, the ones that are likely to come to market fastest, also have to be stored and transported at very low temperatures. That means we need a supply chain and a chilled chain, or actually a frozen chain, that can distribute at those temperatures. Also, the earliest ones may need two doses. There is one from J&J that may only need one dose and can be transported at near normal temperatures, but that's the outlier. We'll see where that gets to. I'm not making predictions on the speed at which any one of those will occur, but I would observe that distribution is going to be an issue. The third issue that one would hope will not be the determinant of success or not is, of course, efficacy. And efficacy at this point, it's worth remembering that the flu vaccines are somewhere in the 50, 60, 70 percent range, depending on the mutation of the virus at any point in time. It's likely we're going to see similar numbers for this vaccine. So what does all that mean? It means the point of the virus is in effect to induce the famous herd immunity, to get it out there with sufficient efficacy that it actually lowers the risk of spread because enough people have been inoculated. There is one issue that is now becoming a material one. Will people take the vaccine? Now, the numbers for the UK are relatively positive in that regard. But if you go to France or you go to the United States, we're now in the sort of 50% of people say they will even take the vaccine. So there's a bit of maths that comes into action here. What's the efficacy rate times the rate at which people can access it times the, the ability of people to actually want to take it? And if you do that math, you start to get to numbers that fall below 50%. That matters because you start to drift into territory that says, hmm, this is not a given. So we need the vaccine, but let's remember this. It's probably coming, but there's still real work to do to distribute it and to ensure that it's taken at the levels which will induce the effect we're looking to see. So lots of uncertainty remains. Lots of uncertainty remains. And uncertainty is the enemy in one part of this story as to what we were able to do and how quickly we'll be able to do it. Now, I could get into the economic forecasting game, but I was once told that economic forecasting exists to make astrologers look good. And I think there is some truth to that. In other words, somebody also once told me they predicted five of the last two recessions. Now, I need to be really careful because I don't want to upset Anton and the economic profession. I think there is value to it. But we came up with nine different scenarios because picking any one scenario is really difficult to be confident. And the scenarios that most likely in our minds exist suggest that we're looking to about quarter two of 2022 before we get back to where we were in 2019 from an economic viewpoint. Now, that's quite some time to wait. Of course, we all hope and believe the health situation may improve before then. But here's the point. One without the other will not succeed. It's the point that Anton made. And that's why 
the health situation remains critical to understanding the economic situation. So if we get our crystal balls out, we say, well, what will the future look like? Let me be very brief in saying, I think there's a great American philosopher also happened to play baseball, which I think of as rounders, but the Americans insist in calling baseball. So he played rounders. His name was Yogi Berra. And he had a great saying, the future ain't what it used to be. But if I was given the chance to say, what are the forces that I think we're likely to see? First and foremost, an acceleration of digitization and innovation. This is probably going to be a period of unprecedented innovation. It already is from a healthcare angle. Secondly, increased role of government. Government is going to be playing more of a role. Why? Because of the situation Anton already described. Government is already the lender, the borrower, and also the insurer of last resort, and ultimately the owner of many private sector enterprises. Three, we are going to see a recommitment and a reinvention of healthcare. Telemedicine and telehealth has been talked about for decades. Now it's actually happening. Four, a greater balance between social and economic goals. This is a humanitarian crisis. It is also one that threatens to promote inequality at a scale that is truly troubling, and it's already troubling. I could spend a lot of time on this. Anton already touched on it. Five, the need for a green recovery. I don't think we can afford a brown recovery. If we've learned one thing from this pandemic is that when you can see an event coming, it's best to prepare for it. We can see coming the environmental challenge. This is an opportunity, given the scale of stimulus and investment in infrastructure, to actually ensure that we have investment against the green recovery. It's time to take that and likely to be followed by governments, I think, at this rate. Six, we're going to see a redefinition of work and the role of cities. Many cities have already seen a depopulation occurring. That's particularly true in the US and parts of the European economies have been less impacted. But nevertheless, the way work gets done is certainly changing. Remote working, we could spend ages on that topic. Seven, we are seeing shifting geopolitics. That's been accelerated, not created by the virus. But you don't need to look far in the newspaper to see the headlines and understand the tensions that exist. Eight, well, I think we're going to see a move to a more resilient and efficient economy. I don't think it's one or the other. A lot of economies have been built on being just in time. Now they're going to be built on being just in case. Anton touched on that, so I won't spend long on it. Let me close with one thought. 1968. I don't know how many of you were around in 1968. I was two years old, so I don't remember it very well. But I went to my daughter's last day of school when the principal stood up to give her a speech. She said, I am a child of 1968. She was pretty old, but in great shape. And she said, the reason I mention this is you are in the equivalent year. 1968 was not a great year for the world. It was a horrendous year for the world. Think about what happened in 1968. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Robert F. Kennedy was murdered. We had lots of troubles around the world. Vietnam was in full flow. And there were riots in Paris. Well, okay, I guess that happens many years. So maybe that's not the bellwether for what was a bad year. But nevertheless, they were particularly bad student riots right across Europe and particularly in France. Bad it was. 1969 then came along. And in 1969, took a different turn. We had the Beatles perform in the roof of Apple Records. You've probably all seen the iconic imagery. We had lots of legislation passed against racism and injustice. We also had uh, the launch of the Concorde. Concorde flew for the first time, an amazing technological marvel. And perhaps most notably, we also saw man land on the moon. The Eagle has landed in July of 1969. The question that head teacher asked my daughter's class is, what are you going to do now to ensure that 2020 is the precursor to 2021. And I think in there lies the question and lies the one that we might want to grapple with. A more optimistic view, we will have a vaccine. We'll probably have that vaccine by the end of 2021. It will give us more confidence. There's a chance that all this innovation will start to be harnessed in a positive way. And it will allow us to ensure that that economic recovery does come, even if it's 2022 before we see the fruits of it. But it is worth dwelling on that thought and maybe ending on a more positive note. So my question for you is, what are you doing to ensure we're in 1969 and we don't end up in a repeat of 2020, which can only be described as the year that keeps on giving? Thanks so much, Kevin, for that fantastic overview. And um, I, like, I like the positive ending and the optimism that you know, this 2020 could be the precursor to, to greater things in 2021 and 2022. And um, I'm sure we'll get more comments on that actually as we go through.
Um, I did just want to do another quick check-in because lots of people on the chat have been sharing where they're joining us from. So we have people now from New York, Kevin actually, uh, from Dominican Republic, from my home city, Aberdeen, um, and also from Italy, Anton. In fact, one of your old Erasmus students um, has joined us this evening. And the reason that I mention that is because something that's coming up in the chat, and actually it was a question that I wanted to pose directly, um, was the impact of uh, the pandemic on this sense of global protectionism. And how can we stop countries, governments, from actually looking inward at this time? And at the same time, we have the US election, Kevin, uh, coming upon us. And yeah. we're also going to be dealing with the fallout of Brexit. What does all of this mean as well um, in line with the pandemic? How can, we, how can we stop our countries from becoming actually islands and, and pretty isolated from one another? Kevin, I'll, I'll hand over to you first if that's okay. And you may want to touch on your thoughts on the US election as well. <laughs> well, the US election is one thing I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on. I have no vote. I observe it and uh, I'll leave that for others to, to get into. But I think this is an important question in terms of the trends that we see. Let's recall this. Global trade of physical goods was actually in decline and has been in decline for quite some time. Um, this is one of the great things that you know, we miss in some of the data. What has been increasing is trade in services and in data. Data is moving around the world at far greater numbers and people. People were moving around the world in far greater numbers. So the shock to the system isn't actually around the trade flows it, it, uh, in terms of physical goods. It's actually services, people, and data. What's going to happen there? Some of that's going to be very hard to stop. Governments can try, but the movement of data in particular is going to be hard. But they can certainly do their damage on the movement of people and actually on the ability to move services around. And that is definitely being impacted. The biggest tragedy of much of this is to see some of the national vaccine nationalism was a phrase that I'd never heard of until we reached this moment. In truth, of course, just think about that. Are these vaccines going to be more rapidly developed if they were left to only one country's scientists? The answer to that is an emphatic no. And what is wonderful to see is that in many cases, we're seeing collaboration occurring to bring these vaccines to a point that we never would have expected to be possible given the speed at which science is progressing. So I think part of it we have to look towards and just understand some of the more fundamental issues that are going on here. One is a lot of what you describe actually had its genesis way before this pandemic. The pandemic just brought it to a greater focus and a greater sense of happening. And that is the tensions that are existing between economies around the world, perhaps because of global power shifts, perhaps because of unfairness around the way in which goods are getting traded. Let's be clear, that was the case. There are definite imbalances and indeed tariffs that are different for one country to export to another. And that, I think, is part of a legitimate concern that countries were expressing. The other side of the coin is the inequality. Who has actually benefited from the previous order, the previous global order? And that's where you can see that, sadly, uh, not everyone did benefit. And I think there was always going to be a reckoning and a rebalancing. What I hope people realize, though, is that that rebalancing will turn to be even more aggressive if indeed we stop the movement of goods, people and services around the world. One example to make that very clear, think about the impact on the developing world of telling companies that they should move their production of goods to another part of the world. The developing world completely depends on being able to provide goods and indeed to manufacture them and have those bought by their Western counterparts. If all of that gets repatriated, it will devastate many emerging economies. That's a second order effect of some of the decisions that could be made. It is important we understand that global trade of goods and services is a very important part of driving the economic growth on which the world depends. Turning back from that will have a high price, but that doesn't mean we can be blind to the issues of inequality and start to really look at how investments get made and how those fundamental issues get addressed. And Antoine, I'm not sure if you want to, to jump in on this as well. I mean, uh, Simone Hutchinson has, has also asked you, what is the impact specifically for Scotland uh, with regards to the pandemic and as a result of the impact of Brexit as well? Well, let, let me address the Scottish point in a moment. Uh, just, I mean, Kevin has outlined the, the issues around protectionism very well. And I won't add to this. I'll add perhaps one thing, which is that political leadership at a global level has never been more important than now. Uh, 
if you look at the way in which we handled the 2007, 8, 9 financial crisis, there was a very concerted response by the G20 uh, at the time. Now, that, that didn't last for various reasons, but that initial response was very important because otherwise there could have been a retreat at that point into protectionism. So ju just to echo, uh, to just to add to Kevin's point, I think it's really, really important that world leaders now you know, avoid slipping back into uh, the kind of things we saw in between the two world wars, which had a, a massively negative impact on, on, on the whole world and certainly won't address some of the issues we're trying to address like climate change and, and inequality. Turning to Scotland, I, I mean, I think I, I would say two things. One of the things that we tried to emphasize in our advisory group on economic recovery was that some of the issues that Scot the Scottish economy faced even before the pandemic need to be addressed as part of this transition to the new normal. So the focus and increased focus on research and innovation on sectors that are genuinely going to benefit, you know, make, make some progress, particularly since we are going to be living not only in a post pandemic world, but in a certainly immediately in a post Brexit world, when the kind of things that uh, Kevin was talking about, the kind of sectors uh, that Kevin was talking about, which is have complex supply chains throughout Europe, will be hit hard, you know, aerospace, automotive, these will not do well in a post-Brexit world. So Scotland needs to reorient itself towards some of these industries that, and particularly, you know, some of these new technologies, tech, uh, med tech, um, uh, life sciences that are going to do well in that sort of world. But, you know, the answer is for like for all small economies, be careful not to get trapped in, in areas which are very labor intensive uh, at low skills uh, that you know, value high skills and pretty much look at those sectors which are going to be doing well in terms of, um, you know, sort of new new technologies and innovation, but but particularly ones that don't uh, rely the protection uh, of, on the protection of trade barriers because we are going to be in a rather different situation from next year. Thanks, Anton. Um, and just kind of following on from, from what both of you have already said, um, we do have a question from uh, Alan Bertie, one of our alums and donors, and, and he's asked, you know, given that the pace of recovery uh, will be very different across different industries, as you've already pointed to, what can businesses or policymakers do to make the adjustment less painful and prevent a long-lasting unemployment crisis? Um, again, Anton, do you want to maybe start with this one and then I'll hand over to Kevin? I, I think the lessons, uh, Rachel, uh, and thanks to Alan for this question, I, I think the lessons from all the other adjustments that we've seen when there's been major structural change in the economy is that you need to invest in training and skills. Um, what made the 1980s uh, recession in many countries, especially the UK, very painful was this lack of uh, investment at the time in, in the transition. Um, and certainly helping uh, those young people who are going through transitions, whether it's from school to work or whether it's from school to college or from college university into work, uh, managing that transition by supporting them is going to be absolutely key over the next uh, next while. That's what I would say. Uh, looking at how job creation can be targeted on particular sectors again, which are the ones that are going to succeed as opposed to simply a scattergun approach. Uh, that's, a, that's a short answer to what is a complicated question, however. It is a complicated question. Uh, Kevin, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think Alan's question is a complicated one. And, and it's, I think there's a few things to remember about this uh, situation versus prior recessions. This one was induced by a health crisis, not a banking system failure, which was the arguable cause of the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, 2010. And therefore, in some cases, what you have is a suppression of demand that has rapidly occurred, even though people may actually have the financial wherewithal to choose to spend, they don't. Confidence around going to a restaurant isn't necessarily increased by having money. It's increased by feeling safe. And one of the challenges, therefore, I think the roles that governments have to play is to understand to what extent are we bridging to the future, recognising that that future is quite some time away, in which case funding and support in the interim period becomes crucial, versus we're delaying an inevitable restructuring that will occur because the role of businesses have changed, in which case we better get off to doing things differently and not preserve old ways of doing things. And the issue we've got is this, this situation has a bit of all of that going on. Some of what we're seeing is an acceleration of the shift to automation and digitization. 
think about the way people are shopping. And that's not going to be reversed, or at least it's not going to be fully reversed. So to prop up the parts of the business empire that don't recognize that would be at least a questionable use of public resources because there's no going back. People have decided this is what they're going to do and this is how it's going to work. And we can push prod and all the rest of it, but there, has go there is going to be a more digitized economy. To meet the needs of a digital economy, though, we need to make sure we train people and that we find ways to support them as factories get automated. And that was one of the challenges before the pandemic, which I think people were talking about. We did some work that showed that about 60% of all jobs, 60% of all jobs, so 30% or more of the tasks associated with that job being automated. Think about that. You know, the way in which people do their work was going to be hugely impacted by automation. Think about publishing, think about even some of the, the services sectors where people go to automate, automated checkouts so they don't go through a regular checkout line. That's a big shift. It doesn't mean the role of the cashier has gone. It means that the nature of the work has changed. And when the nature of work changed, you need to train people. And I completely agree with Anton. I think a major role for government is to do just that, is to find a way to inject the capabilities, fund them, and work with the private sector to ensure that training is provided. I also think a role is to preserve the industries that are going to reappear, that have hit a temporary moment and a really big obstacle and disruption, and ensure they're still around when they're needed in let's say a year or so's time. But that's going to be a tougher one to call because there are many sectors where this is accelerating a fundamental shift and preserving them would not make sense versus others where actually it's really important we preserve the jobs, we find a way to train people and we keep the economies moving. And I think that's the challenge that government faces. Thanks, Kevin. And I actually might just stick with you if that's okay to, to follow up the question yeah. around inequalities. now. Both yourself and Anton spoke about the inequalities of the pandemic, you know, the impact it is having on different countries and different individuals within those countries. Um, I know that this is a real concern for many and actually again a member of our alumni community, Margaret Miller, has asked what can be done to address this? You know, what can we actually be doing in a meaningful way that would help to address some of the inequalities that the pandemic has exacerbated? Well, let's maybe understand what those inequalities are. First of all, there was the inequalities between countries. Actually, countries had inequality between countries had been narrowing, and that was largely due to trade and due to some of the things we talked about earlier uh, and due to the development of the domestic economies in Asia and Latin America in particular and to a lesser degree in Africa. And that had narrowed the gap between countries. Let's make sure we don't do things that actually reopen that gap and make it bigger. That's where nationalism will have its deepest impact. Let's be clear. That's where it will hit hardest. So I hope we can resist the tendencies towards that because a, a lot of the rhetoric around looking after our people will actually mean other people really suffer. It's worth remembering that. But let me put that to one side. The other sources of inequality are many. At one level, it's as basic as those who are in the jobs that most get hit. And of course, no, I say of course, but in many cases, those who are less affluent. This has had a devastating effect on sectors that employ more non-graduates than other sectors. Think retail, uh, think travel, think some of the areas, hospitality, uh, restaurants. These sectors employ a lot of people and give them work without the benefit of the degrees we've got from Glasgow University and other institutions of its kind. How do we therefore support those people becomes a critical question. And the support can take two forms. Direct support, which is one means and obviously most obvious, but another form is creating work. And how does government therefore choose to support the sectors that are likely to thrive and need more people and do so with qualifications that may not be paper qualifications, but experience-based qualifications? That's where we are going to see, for example, a green recovery creates a lot of jobs. Let's not forget that. We did quite a bit of work to show that actually a green recovery can be very productive from a labor point of view. You need people to work if you start creating industries that are more sustainable. And I think that's part of the answer to this. The other form of inequality is gender inequality. And whilst it's actually the case, and we looked at this pretty closely, actually the jobs that will get impacted are a bit of a wash because automation may hit manufacturing jobs, and I'm just going to state facts, which tend towards more male environments harder than they hit other jobs. So it's not as simple to say it's the jobs. What is actually causing the issue is this, what we're doing right now then women are bearing a disproportionate part of the burden of remote working. Remote working isn't the great joy that everybody thought it would be. 
a lot of women are trying to take care of the household and being asked to take care of the household in households where the work is not shared equally. And therefore, it's, it, it is actually really posing a major challenge to equality at a gender level, far greater than I think many have understood. We did some work recently that showed as many as 40% of women with young kids were thinking of taking themselves out of the workforce or taking a break from their careers. And that is a huge setback. And that's where we are now. That's why this is such a big issue on the gender front. So what's the alternative? It means that provision of care, really finding support for actually how work gets done, making the available means to ensure that women don't bear the brunt of all that we're having, that becomes so much more important. And gender inequality is a massive issue, which is going to be profoundly exacerbated if left to continue on the current trends that we're seeing now. And I'm afraid that remote working is one of the major contributors to that. Lots of good things about it, though. The possibility is it gives flexibility. It allows people to do things at their own pace and in their own way. That is actually one of the number one things in our surveys and research we've found would help gender equality. But at this moment in time, it's going the other way. It's actually ensuring that women are taking a step back in the workforce. And if and that's occurring at a time when we're not even close yet to inequality and so to equality. And so that's, I think, the number one concern. And I think a lot of funding and targeted support needs to be put in that area. I think that's really interesting, Kevin. We could probably spend the rest of the evening or whole evening talking about gender equality because, of course, there is an impact around the, the climate emergency and how it adversely Absolutely. impacts on women as well. So there's kind of a double whammy, actually, with the pandemic and, and the climate emergency on gender equality in, in our organisations. Um, Anton, is there anything that you would like to add to what Kevin has already um, highlighted? Kevin's covered it very well, but l let me just make two points. Uh, one is that, uh, as, uh, as Kevin pointed out, trade and the integration of the world economy has done a huge amount to reduce uh, poverty around the world. And there's uh, some very good books by Branko Milanovic, who used to be in the World Bank Research Department, which shows very clearly that when we talk about inequalities uh, and growing inequalities, it's largely focused on um, what we might call the lower and mid lower to middle socioeconomic groups in the advanced economies. That's where often that drive and that, that anti sort of uh, trade uh, uh, sort of approach has come from, and that that sort of uh, economic nationalism has come, uh, which has you know tried to create some some voices for protectionism over the last few years. So we we need to make sure that we you know we 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 don't lose that those gains that we've made certainly over the last, uh, over the period since 1945. The other, the other point I was going to make, which is I think important, and it follows from one of the earlier um, responses that Kevin made, which is that the world economy is changing. It services, trade and services are becoming more important. That also makes it much more difficult for national governments to actually uh, tax companies, because if it was easy for companies in the manufacturing areas to shift profits around the world, it is incredibly easy for companies in, in the service sector to do so because of the way in which you account for uh, for different inputs. And um, this needs to be addressed. And, and I, you know, we've seen individual countries trying to impose digital taxes or trying to patch this problem by saying we're losing a lot of the tax base or we don't have access to it through corporation taxes. We need to do something. Let's introduce, you know, and these are knee jerk reactions around digital taxes and things like that, which which frankly won't work in, in, in the long run because uh, because most of the companies find it very easy for the reasons that, that Kevin mentioned to move around the world. So I think if you really want to try and look at the balance of taxation between labor and capital, which is one of the issues around inequality, then there needs to be, again, a bit like trade, a supranational agreement. You're not going to fix this uh, individually if you're the EU or, 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 or indeed the United States. It needs a, 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 a supranational approach. So I really hope we make some progress there because otherwise... I think, again, these are some of the forces of around unfairness which drive some of the voices of economic nationalism. Thanks, Anton. And of course, the nature of the economic crisis keeps evolving with the pandemic. So in economic terms, are there some shocks which could hit us in the recovery phase? Are there particular things that, that are giving you sleepless nights? Um, and I guess linked to this, actually, uh, Kim Tufi asks, what changes do you think will be permanent as a result of the pandemic? So, um, Kevin, I'll, I'll come to you first, if that's okay. You know, the, the shock that I worry a lot about is the chart that Anton showed with debt. Modern monetary theory is a topic we could get into. 
which I think is underpinning a lot of the hope that somehow or other all this investment support debt that's been built up will just be okay uh, for currency issuing uh, uh, countries. That's a theory that is on a knife edge, I think was Anton's polite way of expressing where we are. Uh, you know, all this is happening at a time of low interest rates, and so therefore we're running up all this debt, low interest rates, it can be serviced, and so on. What if that theory is wrong? What if actually we find that that's not going to happen, and we're going to have to find a way to pay back that debt or avoid our kids being burdened by it? That really could be a devastating blow at a time when we need to invest in our health systems, we need to invest in the support we've been discussing, we need to invest in actions to stem the tide of inequality. There's a real challenge to the global economic order if some of the theory that's being touted and in which I think a lot of hope is being placed. Now, clearly, we're in the middle of a battle and we need to throw everything at it, as Christine Lagarde said only a few weeks ago, and she's right. But there is just, if you ask me what worries me, I worry about that shock. You know, where's that shock? What's that going to do to us? The second shock, of course, one worries about is the health shock. You know, the second wave, the third wave, what if the vaccines are delayed? What happens if we actually find that this thing mutates in a way that's unfavorable. There's so many uncertainties there. In a way, I'm trying to keep my mind more positively organized and not focus on those. But let's recall that this is a period of uncertainty. And uncertainty is one of the things that is most associated with times of economic distress. And it's that reason, if you want to go down, I think, the path of theory, which is creating the reality of the economic order will not be settled by anything other than resolving this health crisis. And, and it's I think dangerous to assume otherwise, because that uncertainty index is just going to keep moving. Uh, Germany announces the closure of restaurants and bars. France will do something similar, it seems, uh, and if it's not already done so, we'll do it in an hour or so when Macron speaks. So if we put all that together, you see these levels of uncertainty. If they reach levels which are at the same level they were in March, then the shock again that we're going to see, which will then impact the markets and others, I think will really be quite profound. And the biggest shock of, call, of all, of course, would be if uh, confidence on behalf of the people erodes and the institutions that are so important to allowing uh, the governments of the countries which they control and oversee to operate. If that breaks down, then we've got all sorts of problems. I'm hoping we're far away from that. I, I really believe that that would be a bigger shock than any of the others, and I'm hoping we don't get there. But we have a big election taking place in the United States next week, and let's hope that that goes off in an orderly fashion, in an appropriate way. I think it will. But, you know, we, we, it's not even worth contemplating what happens if some of those shocks occur in major economies. That's not very cheap. Yeah, no, agree. <laughs> <laughs> you were doing so well as well with your introduction. I know I was, but it's a good uh, day out there in New York, so it feels sort of an appropriately grey and sombre <laughs> occasion to offer that view. Uh, and then we can get happier, I'm sure. 1969. <laughs> It's, it's, it's interesting what you were saying, though, about public confidence, because actually some of the comments in the chat have been around, well, even if there is a vaccine, will people take it? You know, will there be confidence in taking the vaccine and will that will that create some, some challenges for us further down the line? But anyway, Anton, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Is there anything else that you would like to add? How are you sleeping? Um, well, uh, I'm sleeping well, but I, know I generally sleep very well. Uh, so I'm not too worried about, about my sleeping patterns. But... Two, two quick points, um, because uh, I, like Kevin, I'm, I'm a big skeptic around mod modern monetary theory, I'm afraid. And I, I do believe that at the end of the day, we need to manage this. Now, we have managed it before. Uh, after the Second World War, we had a period in which, uh, because of financial repression, interest rates were kept low, growth took off. And during the 15, 20 years after 1945, many of the countries like the UK, for instance, that built up a lot of debt were able to pay that off. Now, uh, that's fine, but there's no guarantee that we're going to go into a financial repression period. And therefore, it's, you, know, you could easily see a situation in which uh, um, you know, interest rates, real interest rates rise relative to growth, or if growth doesn't recover quickly, trend rate of growth doesn't recover quickly, and then you're, you have a crisis of confidence in public finances. So I totally agree with that. One of the things that does worry me, I have to say, is also in one of the dogs that hasn't really barked yet as part of the, the crisis, is the whole recapitalization around uh, you know, the business sector. Um, and that's a serious issue. I mean, there's a lot of companies that are taking punts at the moment on the recovery and that they'll be able to see themselves through this phase of, re of recovery into the post-COVID era. And uh, you know, some of them won't. Now, 
if they don't, then it's about where we need to preserve activity. And Kevin's already covered that. We can't preserve activity where that sector doesn't have a future, but we do need to be selective in that front. But for those companies that uh, are in the sectors that will actually recover or could potentially see through it, there is quite a big effort of recapitalization. Some of the losses of the, of the business sector will then fall also on the banking sector. And we have seen before following major economic crises, how some of the, 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 the effects will be quite prolonged because of the echo effect through, through liquidity and credit. And that does worry me still. Um, we haven't quite seen all that uh, evolve. And I, I'm noticing that certainly the banking sector is being a bit tighter on credit. They're obviously a bit worried about you know, exactly how the recovery will, will evolve. And we're going to begin to see some of those that credit tightening happen, I suspect, in the next year or two. Yeah, um, I'm very conscious of time and I think we're literally getting down to the last five minutes. So I'm, I'm going to ask one one final question. Um, and it would be remiss of me not to ask a question very specifically about higher education and uh, what we think the impact of the pandemic will be on higher education in longer term. And you know, where does education sit on the K-shape? Anton, I'll, I'll start with you. Well, I'm very optimistic, actually, Rachel, on this one. I, I actually do believe that higher education is on the right bit of the K. Um, and that's for two reasons. One, because uh, the demographics uh, trends of the last few years speak very clearly. There's huge demand uh, from a growing uh, middle class uh, across the world for certainly for, for higher education. Um, and then there's the other effect, which we actually have been discuss uh, discussing throughout the last hour, which is that skills and, and, and education are at the heart of the changes that we want to happen to the world economy around uh, you know, new sectors, innovation, and, 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 and building back better. That will not happen without higher education. And I, uh, you know, I see certainly the demand for higher education be extremely strong. If I look at the University of Glasgow at the moment, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We're having to deliver all of our teaching online, most of our teaching online, and, and yet I see still huge demand for what it is we offer, both from a domestic uh, student body, but also from an international student body. Uh, and that gives me real hope for the future. I do think that, I think the, the effect will be differential. I think it will depend on which university you're talking about and which country. But I do think that, that you know, prospects are very, are very good for higher education generally at an international level. That's great. Thank you so much, Anton. And Kevin, I'm going to give you one last opportunity to end in a high. Do you have any kind of last optimistic words? Well, I think that is the us? high. You know, we've just, yeah. if you think about what we're all living through at the moment, I think there's a renewed appreciation of science, of expertise, of skills, of the need for education. So I think the underpinnings for the change in mindsets around how do we think about the kind of lives we want uh, is profound. And it it doesn't all need to go in a bad direction. We have a renewed appreciation for health. I think people now at a much younger age are aware of the importance of health. I was talking to a major consumer goods company's CEO, and we were chatting about demand for products. And I know this sounds odd and impossible to believe of anyone in Glasgow, but actually soap and deodorants and some of the things you would have thought would go south have actually gone up. But more importantly, attitudes towards vitamins and all sorts of entry-level products into healthcare have shifted younger. People are now much more aware of health and the vulnerability of health. That's a positive. I think people now appreciate healthcare a lot more. I think they appreciate expertise. We're hanging on the edge of our seats trying to figure out what's going to happen with this vaccine. And we're all becoming vaccine experts. That talks to expertise. Science, that's what's going to give us the vaccine. People are renewed appreciation for science. There's a lot that's going on here that I think can be a positive. And I hope as we contemplate this moment, and it is a dark moment with all the challenges it's got, we remember this, there will be astonishing innovation. And I know he wasn't at Glasgow University, but I can't help reminding everyone that Isaac Newton was one of the beneficiaries of the first experiment in remote working. When Cambridge University shut down, I guess it was in the 17th century or so, and they sent their students home, Newton went home and watched an apple fall. And the theory of gravity and all the things that he then started to, to contemplate, well, that was done through remote working because it was a period of innovation. We started to think great thoughts. And let's hope that that happens too. So I don't think it's all doom and gloom. Out of this adversity will undoubtedly come a period of remarkable innovation and new ways of working. And what we did today where people are beaming in from a far afield is New York and Buenos Aires, or for that matter, Airdrie. 
uh, we should celebrate because that is a step change. It's great to know people from Airdrie have joined. Hello. Or Aberdeen. As well as actually I know, I know your you oldest. Like Aberdeen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just going to say, Kevin, actually your old debating partner, Jack Silverstone, has also joined and wanted to say hello. There you go. So I'm, I'm passing that on. <laughs> Small world. Um, I'm so sorry because I feel like this conversation could carry on for quite some time yet, but I'm afraid that's all that we have time for this evening. Um, Huge thank you once again to our speakers, uh, Anton and Kevin, and thank you to you all, our global audience, for joining us. And um, you'll be pleased to hear that a link to this recording will be circulated um, along with an evaluation form so we can get some feedback. Please, please do take the opportunity to complete that and send it back. It really will take only a moment, but it makes a big difference to our uh, thinking through what we do next and shaping actually how we deliver these events going forward. Um, as you know, uh, you have just enjoyed the first in our series of World Changing Glasgow Conversations, but I can share with you that the next topic for debate and discussion will be on the really critical area of mental health. Um, and I'm delighted that we'll be joined by our own University of Glasgow Professor Rory O'Connor, who is Chair of Health Psychology in our Institute of Health and Wellbeing. So further information about that event uh, will come out to you in the new year. And I really very much hope that you'll be able to join us for that discussion. Many thanks again for listening and engaging so positively. It's been fantastic to have you join us for this inaugural World Changing Glasgow conversation. Goodbye for now, but we look forward to connecting again soon. And in the meantime, stay safe and take care. Thank you very much.